I think community is very important. There's a lot of work to be done in the fields that we are excited and passionate about. But if we don't help each other, work together, collaborate, it's going to be an arduous pathway. So I'm so excited to see so many people that share a common interest with, with uh, things I'm passionate about, and I hope I have a chance to get to know all of you. Back when I was 12 years old, wait, I'm sorry, I, I'm teasing you about that. I'm not going to be talking about myself. I'm going to be talking about what we're all excited about is the impact of emerging technology and how it's going to change healthcare. So, uh, it'd be great to have my slide deck, which had been there, and I, there we go, okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, over the next short while, I'm going to talk to you about uh, these items. Uh, I'm going to give an overview from my perspective of some of the major forces in play for the digital health revolution. I'm going to talk about some of the emerging and confluent technologies such as AI and 5G that are contributing to that. I'm going to talk about um, uh, the overall landscape of um, VR, AR, uh, what we're starting to call extended reality technologies because I think it's going to be a major driving force for some of the new generations of interventions that we have. I'm going to talk about the neuroscience of why AR and VR technology is so impactful. And um, I'm going to give some examples of where we are right now, what is being used clinically, what's still at the research stage. And then I'm going to do something a little bit risky and, and probably wrong, which is to try and make some predictions about the future. Um, but let's please be dynamic. If there's something that you disagree about that I'm saying or agree about, please don't hesitate to jump up and call me out about it or, or stand up and say that's, that's correct. So I have a number of academic affiliations. Uh, the, for the center right now, I, I spend a lot of my time with the Stanford University Virtual Human Interaction Lab. I also do a lot of work with the National Mental Health Innovation Center. But what I really am concerned about uh, because of my time working at the Stanford Center on Longevity is the upcoming looming crisis that we will have uh, because of an aging population, not just here in the U.S., but worldwide. Since, um, since we were younger, what direction should I be pointing? Towards you? Okay. The U.S. population has doubled since the 1960s, and we're very top-heavy, as you know. Um, we do not have enough young caregivers to support the higher proportion of aging boomers. And as the boomers get up into their 70s, 80s, and 90s, there is, of course, a concomitant increase in the proportion of neurodegenerative disease and stroke and chronic uh, pain issues, uh, mobility issues, and it's going to cause a crisis. Um, two out of every seven of us will have a neurodegenerative disease by the time we're in our 80s, and other problems come along with that. Um, in my opinion, the only solution is to leverage technology. We cannot grow caregivers fast enough. So that is why I spend a lot of my time working with some of the very exciting and emerging uh, technology startups that are focusing on the next generation of healthcare. And um, it's very exciting to see how much momentum has occurred in, in that arena. So as you know, we're in the middle of a digital health revolution um, with a shift in emphasis of not the hospital and the clinic, but where the patient is located. And as we push out better sensor technology, more wearables and better analytics, more consumer technology focused on healthcare, the patient is starting to become the center of gravity. And it's really the full stack of healthcare that has been dramatically affected, starting at prevention and wellness, more objective assessments, uh, improved training, improved interventions, methods to facilitate adherence, and ways to reach underserved populations. I think it's the people in this room, the people that are contributing to the evolution of next generation technology, that are going to be the driving force for this next generation of healthcare. And that's one reason I'm so excited to be here with you today. I hope we can all spend some time um, in the hallways and out on the deck, getting to know each other and finding ways that we can collaborate and, and work together. So as you know, in the last 10 years, every medical device has been reinvented, ranging from thermometers to spirometers to blood pressure devices. We've all moved those from the analog, handwritten world to the digital world. And this, of course, allows us to do some amazing things with analytics. 
We're also entering the era of medical wearables where we can collect a tremendous amount of data by things that we can affix to the body or place in our ear to collect uh, really robust biosensing data. And it's not just the physical parameters of our health that we're collecting right now. We're also getting better at using sensors built into our smartphones or that um, are tracking our activity or our voice tone or our facial expressions or even just how we move and hold an object can be very diagnostic of cognitive function, of mood and, and brain state. So we're leveraging more than just what the wearable sensors can capture about our physiology. We're also coming up with better ways to understand our behavior. And of course, all this information is flooding into uh, a digital backbone that allows us to do some very powerful things. We can aggregate data in an anonymized manner, parse it using uh, machine learning uh, technology and predictive modeling, push interventions to people through some very powerful uh, systems such as AR and VR systems, and I'll give some examples of that, collect data back about behavior and how the interventions are changing uh, mood and, and health status, and push that to the research scientists, the clinicians, and the policymakers so we can better understand how these interventions work. It becomes a, a fast forward uh, feedback loop of improved efficacy as we collect more and more data. It's a very powerful thing that's in motion right now. And one of the things I'm pretty excited about is that we're also moving into the zone of prescription digital therapeutics, where it's not just here's a device, it's not just here's a medication, it's not just here's a cognitive behavioral therapy, it's here's a platform, here's a system where we can combine things and get improved efficacy and track results in a more consistent manner. This idea of combination therapy really opens up some really fantastic possibilities, starting with uh, dose optimization for any therapy. Um, we can treat comorbid conditions and see how they interact. We can use the power of um, uh, behavior shifting and gamification of technology to promote adherence. We can um, collect and analyze the efficacy of the data and again, provide a feedback loop to com come up with um, better tailored interventions for the individual. And it's really all aspects of clinical care that digital therapeutics are impacting right now, uh, starting with uh, drug discovery and new device development. Um, Understanding the supply chain, because when we use a digital system as part of the delivery process, we can collect data about um, who's using it, how often they're using it, where they're using it, and when they don't use it. Um, we have data that will facilitate better um, and faster regulatory approval. Uh, we can provide clinicians with details about utilization that they otherwise would never see. Patients get feedback about their utilization, and we have data we can use to fund um, or pay uh, provide information to those people that are part of the payer cycle, facilitate reimbursement. So really it's all part, every part of the uh, channel of payment of the ecosystem is being affected in a very positive way with patients, clinicians, and payers. Uh, just one example, uh, using a combination therapy approach for depression, where we might pair a digital app or a VR system to help improve mood and, and uh, combine it with a prescription to address anxiety or depression. We can combine that with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. We can uh, do behavioral activation therapy, or we can teach people mindfulness skills. And there's a whole um, derivative cascade of incremental benefit that we get by doing this, by combining a prescription medication with a digital intervention. So let's talk for a moment about what is um, coming down the pipe in terms of emerging technologies that support this digital health revolution. Well, first of all, I'm really excited about 5G and edge computing. I think as we start having uh, low latency connections, uh, the ability to do analytics, uh, machine learning, and uh, um, computer rendering uh, on the edge and push it to our display devices. And we'll talk a little bit about VR and AR technology. I think this is going to allow us to really speed up things right now, reduce the latencies in, in everything that we've been doing. And 5G is very close. Of course, the progress in machine learning it allows us to really understand the patterns in what we're doing and come up with personalized medicine based on those analytics. And we can do predictive modeling, help understand who's at risk and 
how to modify their treatment plan or, or their be, shift their behavior in order to uh, you know, adjust to their specific health care condition. Um, we've leveraged the concept of the digital twin from the industrial arena. We've moved this over to the healthcare arena. So we now are building models of ourselves as individuals enforced by data to uh, create this digital twin paradigm and using it as a way to monitor our own health and health status of others. And of course, uh, one of the themes of this conference is better sensors. And as you know, sensors are evolving very fast. Um, we're moving into the next generation of sensors. And I think there's also hand in hand with that, a cultural shift that because we're monitoring so many things because of the internet of things and the derivative aspects of it, our culture is shifting too, to an always on, always monitored, always measured culture. Whether we feel comfortable with that or not, it, it is happening and it's gonna inform and impact healthcare in a, in a really dramatic way. Um, in my zone, working with uh, virtual reality and augmented reality technology, the fact that we now have better computer graphics, better sensors, allows us to come up with better virtual humans. Uh, artificial characters that can talk with us, interact with us, and also study our facial expressions, our voice tone, uh, our body language, and use that to inform their behavior towards us. Our smart cars will be studying our behavior, our, our uh, facial expressions, our voice, voice tones, in order to adapt to our, our mood. And the technology enabling that is going to have dramatic impact on healthcare. Um, those avatars have sort of crossed over from what used to be um, the left side of what we call the uncanny valley. We now have um, AI-driven avatars that look photorealistic and have facial expressions, and sometimes are hard to tell from um, um, a human who's interacting over a, uh, a computer interface. So we're getting much better with, um, with that aspect of interventions. And of course, we're having other things evolve, such as blockchain and other ways to help protect the data that we're collecting and aggregating. So those are some of the emerging and confluent technologies that, that are empowering this digital health revolution. I'm really excited personally because it's been um, something I've been passionate about for several decades now, about how um, virtual reality and augmented reality technology is, is moving in. And I'll go into some details about the neuroscience of why this is very powerful technology as part of this digital health ecosystem. Um, I should point out that there seems to be a trend to uh, combine the terms virtual reality with augmented reality and mixed reality technologies into one term called extended reality. I would not be surprised if we have yet another term in the next few years. So um, I'm not committing to the term extended reality, but I'll use it for the purposes of this talk. And the landscape of what's going on in the uh, virtual reality arena is evolving extremely fast. Um, the generation cycle is so um, short, and the new technologies are coming out uh, almost on a weekly basis. So I, I'm going to do my best to give you an overview of the landscape, but um, it changes very dramatically. But fortunately, there's some other experts uh, in this topic in the room, and uh, I may call upon them to uh, agree or disagree with me if we have time. But now is the time for this technology. Um, it's been evolving over the last um, um, three or four decades, and it's finally at a point where it's affordable and comfortable to use. Uh, every major um, consumer electronics company is making a play into this arena. I've listed just a few of them. Uh, we're all holding our breath to see what Apple is up to, but other groups have made significant investments, and they know that this technology will not bring a return on their investment unless it crosses over from entertainment and gaming and comes over to the enterprise. And the deepest enterprise, the most important enterprise, is gonna be the medical enterprise. So I think over the next few years, we will see these, comp these companies start playing a more active role in the medical vertical. Uh, some of them have already started to make moves in that direction. Um, so why use VR and AR technology um, to, as part of a next generation computer platform? Well, it really has some unique capacities. We can slow down time. We can take people to another spot. We can um, connect them in a way that leverages their cognitive processes. And we can make it a very deeply personal experience to use a virtual reality experience as you interact with information with other people and with technology. 
So again, just quickly, uh, a little bit of nomenclature. When we say virtual reality, we usually talk about when we're fully immersed in a computer-generated environment and interactive with uh, controllers. Augmented reality is when we tag digital objects and overlays upon the real world. And mixed reality is sort of the spectrum between the two, where we interact with information and um, have a dynamic display, sometimes something we're wearing that, that overlays the world with extra information in a digital format. And sometimes we don't have to wear anything at all. We step into a room and we track our, our facial expressions, our body language, our hand positions, and use that as the controller. So some of you have probably heard people talk about the fact that VR has died out, that it really uh, had a, a rapid, brisk start a few years ago going into entertainment and gaming, but it's plateaued. And the data really is um, showing something different. It's moving over from the entertainment and gaming arena to the enterprise. And if you look at the uh, statistics and compare the adoption rates of VR and AR technology to the adoption rates of other emerging technologies such as VCRs or um, uh, smartphones or personal computers, the slope of um, this movement forward is much faster than what we've seen for those other technologies. Um, there was a report recently that there are 1.3 million monthly connected VR headsets to the Steam platform, and that's just a gaming platform. 1.3 million monthly connects, and the slope of the rise is um, asymptotic. So we're, we're growing exponentially. Uh, we're at the knee of the curve for a um, uh, exponential evolution of the technology. And the projections are that within six years there will be 70 million users of VR and AR systems. So how does this impact um, what we're all interested in in terms of the digital health revolution? Well, I'll give some examples of that. Um, again, it's the full stack. Uh, I'll give examples from all aspects of healthcare where the technology is going to impact. And, I'm excited today that we'll have um, people from um, Sixth Sense and Penumbra presenting their uh, product that's used for stroke rehabilitation. But right now, there's more than 200 emerging uh, early stage companies that have developed unique applications leveraging VR and AR technology and put them into the clinical arena. Some, some of these are further along than others, but almost all of these have made that leap from just the university environment, uh, the research lab, these are products that are out currently used in clinical care. And there's also been significant investments. I did sort of a, a brief tally uh, last night, and I was able to add up almost more than uh, 300 million that has been invested by uh, for strategic investors and venture investors into the emerging VR, AR healthcare arena. And the products that are being developed are addressing some multi-billion dollar, very expensive problems that we have in our healthcare system. It's very exciting to see. There's a number of industry associations and conferences uh, forming. The FDA is having a meeting uh, in March 5th in, um, in Bethesda. We're holding, holding a conference specific to virtual reality and healthcare at Vanderbilt on March 2nd and 3rd. Uh, there's a conference at Cedar sinai later in March. And there's an industry association, the International Virtual Reality Healthcare Association. So the field is gathering uh, tremendous momentum. So let me spend a moment um, talking about how VR, why VR is so powerful in the neuroscience of why it is particularly a powerful technology, especially in behavioral medicine. Um, but you know, I think I'm going to cause for cause, just pause for a moment, uh, get some feedback from the audience here. Um, um, what do you guys think about this? Is anybody, um, uh, act, who else is excited about uh, what's going on with the digital health revolution? Well, actually, let me ask another question. How many of you have used a virtual reality system? That's incredible, almost everybody in the room. I think uh, a few years ago, um, it probably would have been um, maybe five or six people would have raised their hands. So it's really been a sea change in terms of that. How open are seniors to using that's a very good question. The, the question was, how open are seniors to using uh, VR headsets? Um, 
There's a couple of companies that are selling to the senior market, and they report that the seniors are actually more open than many of the people that are, in the, that are younger. Um, it's because you don't have to text little small buttons. Um, okay, excellent, thank you. And it's also a matter of, um, uh, it provides a way for them to connect with family and friends uh, or go places they've never been. So seniors are actually uh, briskly adopting the technology. How close are we for miniaturizing VR? That's a very good question in terms of porting it into less uh, heavy yeah. systems. Um, there's some systems in, in, in development that I think we'll see come out very soon that are very non-obtrusive and that uh, um, are battery powered. They'll be using edge computing to do the rendering. I'm, I, Nathan, I think it's probably gonna be five years before we have something that's uh, very common there. Um, um, Andy, do you have? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I actually have a question for It's, it, the question of immersion is an interesting one. I think it depends. I think if you're treating post-traumatic stress or you're dealing with pain or you're dealing with um, um, something where you need to block out the outside world in order to get the work done, um, you must have a fully immersive system. Um, I think that otherwise your imagination won't go where the clinician is trying to take you. On the other hand, if you're doing something um, where you're um, trying to do rehabilitation or promote exercise or connect people with um, their environment and teach them a new process, maybe an activity of daily living. I think in that case, you want to use um, a, a non-immersive system. Um, I think we will have a spectrum of immersion in the systems that we have uh, moving forward. Uh, yes? Does it have any uh, efforts impact on children that when are still developing whether we wire it? That is a really important question. The question was, um, what's the impact on the developing brain, especially the vestibular ocular system for children who are wearing these systems? And the answer is, we don't know. Um, I think that my, my own hunch is that it's gonna be much like, we get into a car right now, we sort of change our mode of interacting with the environment to adapt to that environment, and then we think nothing of going like this and going like this to move, and we step out of the car and we start walking. And I think our brain is very flexible in that way. But for a evolving brain, we're, which we're fooling by putting um, uh, a screen very close to the eyes and changing the accommodation reflex, I, I think it's, we're, we just don't know. And so, as a result, most of the people that are using VR clinically and most of the HMD manufacturers are recommending not to spend a huge amount of time in a virtual environment, especially if you're a young person. Yes? Maybe you'll get to this in a little bit, but how much of this is a combinational where voice, smart avatars, and VR work together, or XR work together, versus just an XR? So how digital therapeutics need to combine these things together, and uh, what's your view on that? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Right now, things have been sort of, um, many of the, the technology groups that have jumped into uh, coming up with medical products come from either the tech sector, maybe they come from the healthcare sector, maybe they come from the gaming arena, very few know all three. As a result, things are often very disjointed. However, the trend is for people to start combining them. And I, I think that's one of the powers of this conference, and thank you for bringing us together, Lisa, is that we'll have people from the different sectors having a chance to talk with each other. Yes? What do you see as the biggest pain points in reimbursement for digital therapies, VRAI? Um, I think the biggest problem for reimbursement right now is that we have only had um, very pilot data studies. It's really going to take some larger numbers of subjects going through a system to show the power of the technology before we start seeing. But there, you know, uh, there are some programs in place, included, including funded by some larger um, healthcare networks, to understand the validity of. Um, um, of this technology in terms of reducing healthcare costs and improving long-term healthcare outcomes. And I think that will power the reimbursement engine. But also consumers are, aren't waiting. Consumers are jumping in and purchasing systems themselves. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna pause uh, the questions for a bit and I wanna get back to tell you about the, the neuroscience of why VR is uh, so uniquely uh, functional here. Um, 
Well, as you know, we can activate um, uh, neuroplastic changes by leveraging the brain's reward systems. We can shorten the feedback loop and leverage the power of VR systems to do that in a very powerful way. And we can also leverage uh, mirror neuron systems um, to help facilitate uh, um, therapeutic process. And I'll give some examples of that. Um, one of the things that's really exciting about VR is its effect um, uh, in terms of activating the entire um, visual system in a very profound way. Um, when we compare imaginative um, exposure therapy versus VR-enabled exposure therapy, we really see a tremendous difference in the efficacy of the intervention. Um, it's because we can direct the, the user's attention and sort of control their focus. And this allows us to um, activate more sections of the brain and come up with a combined um, intervention that is not just based on um, and limited to a person's imagination. It's also less expensive than doing in vivo um, exposure therapy. And we can have a greater degree of exposure when we use a VR-enabled exposure therapy for post-traumatic stress, for helping with addictions, for any aspect of exposure, for dealing with uh, phobias. Um, we can control the degree of stimulus when we use a virtual environment, which we can't do when we're doing in vivo therapy. Um, one of the techniques that we do at our um, lab at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Center is to leverage uh, mirror neurons by coming up with an image of yourself, your future self. And we have that, um, we have you interact with your future self, bond a little bit with the avatar of your future self, and then we can change your attitudes by seeing uh, yourself in different situations. For example, um, we can link your aged future self to your behavior in real time and have your future self change based on your activity levels, your behavior, your biosignals. And this is a very powerful way to close the feedback loop because often what we do in terms of exercise or in terms of diet does not show up for months. But if we can have it happen almost instantaneously and have a image that you've connected with, such as the avatar of your future self, we've, we've been able to shift attitudes and behaviors very profoundly. So there's a whole list of why AR and VR technology is, is very um, profoundly important in terms of shifting um, um, and as an important tool in uh, behavioral neuroscience. But what I think is one of the most important uh, aspects of this is something that uh, um, leverages the power of story. Healthcare in general can be pretty boring. When you go to a hospital, it's... Uh, something that you don't look forward to, and it's um, not any aspect of healthcare is, is really often quite distressing. Yet, we are wired for stories. And one of the things I think is particularly powerful about AR and VR technology is it allows us to put a narrative behind the therapeutic process. Um, my colleague Jeremy Berenson likes to say that uh, virtual environments are experience on demand. I think it goes beyond that. I think virtual environments are stories on demand. And because of that, we can come up with an individual story for the individual, connect it to the therapeutic process, and leverage the power of, uh, of AR and VR technologies to have them be a participant in their quest, in their story, for very health care, better health care. So um, the technology has, most people don't appreciate that VR technology has been with us for decades. Uh, Amir, uh, you, you know that as well as I do, that we've been working on this for a long time. You notice that Amir wears a hat a lot, and you notice that I'm uh, losing my hair a little bit. Um, uh, I attribute this to the fact that we've all been wearing HMDs for decades. And, uh, um, but it's, and it's a potential occupational hazard. But back in the day, the computers were the size of refrigerators, and the head-mounted displays were very uncomfortable and very heavy. Um, now, we have systems and my point here is that we've had um, decades of research. Most people think that VR for healthcare has evolved just in the last uh, year or two. The reality is that we've been doing studies over three decades showing the pathway for how to apply VR and AR technology. Now we need to redo those studies with larger sample sizes and with today's technology, but it's not something that has just evolved over the last few weeks. Okay, so I'm going to uh, pick up speed a little bit and talk about um, the impact of VR in different sectors of medicine. 
One arena, of course, is medical skill training, both um, surgical procedures and diagnostic procedures, but also how to work as a team, how to be uh, part of a complex process, how to work as part of a group to respond to a large emergency, and how to have empathy for your patients. Um, there's many companies out there that are spending um, um, significant funds to train people how to use their surgical equipment using a simulation of a surgical procedure. And this can be done in a, uh, a multi-user manner. Uh, one company I'm very excited about, Orama BR, is working with um, um, Physicians Without Borders to bring uh, surgical skill training to underserved populations where there is no doctor and somebody has to study up on how to do a complex procedure immediately. And we can do that using VR uh, technology to have them be able to train up and do the procedure um, um, on demand. Of course, um, anatomy and physiology is much, is much more uh, robust to learn it in a three-dimensional manner, as a, especially complex things like the spinal tracts uh, uh, or the different regions of the brain. Uh, what we can see in three dimensions and interact with it. Um, also having virtual patients to practice on, especially if you're uh, practicing how to deliver bad news, uh, the news of um, a terminal illness, for example, to a family. You really want to practice that in a simulated environment rather than in, in real time. And of course, um, one of the powers of virtual environments is that we can have empathy for our, our patients. And we've done some very interesting things at the Stanford Children's Hospital where we've created uh, virtual tours of the process that a patient goes through for the physicians to be able to go through and see what it's like to be in the hospital from the patient's perspective. And of course, uh, we can do a better job of informed consent if we can do a better job of showing uh, the process to our patients. Uh, one of the things I'm most excited about when it comes to applying uh, this technology in healthcare is the improvement in assessments. So much of the assessments we do in healthcare is based on self-report, where we say, how are you feeling today? Uh, how did you feel last week? Um, or please fill in this paper trying to describe um, uh, your cognitive processes. And it's very subjective by and large. Um, what we could do right now, how many of you recognize this scene? By, by, all right. This is something that's typically done to terrorize someone for the first time when they're trying out a virtual environment. It's as we take them up in a high elevator and we, we make them walk a plank. And the reason um, startups and research labs terrorize people this way is that they want to show people that you can evoke a cognitive process, that you can create the feeling of fear and anxiety um, just by, even though your friends are in the room and they're talking to you, you have trouble walking across that plank. And at, at our lab at Stanford, when we do this demo, I'd say probably 30% of the people who come in can't walk across a plank in a virtual environment, even though their friends are in the same room talking to them. What's the point? The point is, we can elicit a feeling of joy, sadness, anger, fear, um, um, excitement on demand. And that's much better. And if we build it into a quest, a therapeutic assessment quest, we can um, come up with a standardized way that is um, culturally diverse, age diverse, and um, more objective as a way of assessing cognitive processes than what we're currently doing. Uh, of course, we're using VR as part of um, radiological imaging and better neuropsychological assessments. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a group in Costa Rica that's using VR during awake patient surgery to do psychological assessments. Um, and you can imagine how much more accurate it is to, some, when someone's going through that very scary procedure of awake neurosurgery, to have them um, do a task in a virtual environment as opposed to saying, how are you feeling? And please try and describe uh, if you're losing any cognitive processing to us verbally. Um, and you don't always have to wear something to do this, these assessments. We have um, rooms that you can step into and go on your um, assessment quest um, that can capture your movement, capture your facial expressions and uh, body language and come up with a really robust assessment of, of um, and, the micro movements in people's uh, use of these VR uh, assessments are, are really interesting in themselves. With machine learning, companies like Altoida have taken those uh, micro movements using an augmented reality system on a, on a tablet to do an assessment that is able to do predictive modeling of conversion from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's five years earlier than some of the other tests. 
So looking at the data that we can get from these very functional tests is allowing us to open up new areas of research. And of course, um, with um, voice analytic and better biomarkers uh, that we can build into the head mount displays, we're gonna come up with some really robust um, assessment systems that can take place in a virtual environment. Uh, one of the groups that's working on coming up with these um, uh, biomarkers is MindMaze, and they're teaming with some of the, one of the larger um, HMD manufacturers to bring that to, um, uh, to virtual reality environments. Uh, I want to tell you very briefly about uh, a project that I had the pleasure of working with um, Lee Williams on. Uh, Lee ha runs the Stanford Center for Precision Mental Health and Wellness. And we did a process of seeing if we could substitute for some of the um, paper and pencil tests that one might be doing at the primary care level for someone who is being assessed for uh, depression or for uh, impulse control issues to see if we could do the neuroimaging uh, combined with virtual reality to come up with a better assessment to do a precision analytics for uh, and classification of what therapeutic pathway a person should go through. Um, Lee um, likes to use um, um, neuroimaging to come up with a measurement of uh, cognitive control versus the default mode um, for someone who is going through a uh, cognitive behavioral process. What we did is we combined that with uh, using something like Fruit Ninja as an impulse control paradigm and a few other challenging environments um, in, and we correlated that with what she was seeing in the imaging system. What's the purpose? The purpose is to do precision medicine and not have to always rely on using a very expensive um, neuroimaging system. If we can use virtual environments to uh, parse out what treatment pathway an individual should go down, should it be a prescription medicine, should it be cognitive behavioral therapy, should it be a combination of both, we can do a better job of um, matching people to the right therapeutic process. Uh, to that um, ends, we've come up with a public database of evocative virtual environments. Uh, you can download them from our website um, um, and we're going to be building a lot more to evoke different emotional cognitive states. And it's a beginning to come up with a library of environments that can be used for research and for clinical care. Um, I want to also um, give you some examples of how VR is being used currently as an improved intervention. Uh, there's a pretty large spectrum of them. Um, for preoperative planning and um, uh, pre-surgical uh, Guided, guidance uh, in real time for image guided surgery. VR environments are being in a very robust manner. Uh, there's suites throughout hospitals used uh, to both plan an operation, inform a patient on what the procedure is going to be, and in real time uh, make sure that the, the clinical team is following that plan. Um, one of the things I'm excited about, in, and we'll hear later today about um, uh, Penumbra and the real system, is that we've had some real surge forward in coming up with better systems for stroke re rehabilitation, traumatic brain injury rehabilitation. Instead of the very boring and arduous process of doing exercise both at, acute at the hospital and after discharge, we can use VR to monitor, enhance, and facilitate that whole process. And I think that's really one of the examples of the great success stories in this arena. I'm also very excited about what's going on in mental health care now. I'm extremely excited because, as you know, our health care system is really blocked and backed up for months. Uh, you can finally make that decision to make a phone call about the problem you're having with alcohol or with depression or with anxiety, and you're told you have to wait three months before you can see someone. So we can use VR as a better way of triaging people and see who should be put at the front of the line. There's a lot of efforts of using uh, VR as a um, distraction and training system for uh, helping people manage chronic pain. But we've also had great results of using VR to help treat uh, post-traumatic stress and phobias and anxiety disorders. Um, there's been great progress in using virtual environments to teach refusal si skills and situational confidence for people who are struggling with addictions. This is something I think is sort of a, uh, an underdeveloped area with great potential and I'd like to see more groups go out and, and start developing systems uh, for that. But really, all aspects of behavioral health care, we've seen uh, systems deployed, right, ranging from uh, anger management and um, psychosis to eating disorders to uh, generalized anxiety disorders, uh, autism and Asperger's, depression, um, attention deficit disorder. We've seen fantastic systems that have been 
uh, validated and are just now in the process of being rolled out into the clinical care system. Uh, one of the things I think is also very powerful is using uh, virtual tours of a hospital uh, guided by uh, patients who've been through the procedure before to help people be familiar with what's going to happen to them when they go to the hospital and reduce the pre-procedure anxiety. And of course, in senior care, we've seen a lot of groups uh, deploying, and, and to your question, Lisa, uh, VR systems to go into senior care centers to help both with um, um, treating uh, problems like stroke, but also to help people have experiences that they otherwise could not have because of restrictions. And then palliative and hospital care, some really fantastic interventions um, uh, supporting, supporting that. And it's not just the clinical um, uh, issues. Uh, there's a lot of breakthroughs in the area of preventive medicine. Again, we've uh, uh, developed systems where we can leverage the concept of the future self to help uh, motivate people to have a healthy behavior. Uh, I would love to see a system where you bond with your avatar, get to feel that your future self is somehow connected to you, see your future self change based on your behavior, but also do some geofencing. So if someone who's struggling with alcohol, for example, starts walking into a bar, their uh, future self will call them up on the phone and say, hey, we talked about this, why are you doing this to me? Um, that feedback loop can also be in, uh, enabled by uh, biosensors. So what are the constraints? What are the gating steps to adoptions? Well, for one thing, despite the fact that we've had decades of research, it's all been on previous generation technology. So we need to redo it with this uh, new generation technology. Also, the sample sizes were small, so now that the technology is much more affordable, we need to redo those studies with larger sample sizes. Um, there's a, still a perception that VR is a gaming platform. Um, I think we're breaking through that, but um, there still is some hesitation um, for people to get involved in using VR therapeutically. And I think most importantly, uh, many of the groups that are developing uh, applications leveraging VR, and it's not just VR technology, it's digital health in general, um, are coming from the tech sector, they're coming from the gaming sector, they're coming from the app development sector, and they don't quite understand what's really needed in terms of the ecosystem of a clinical environment. We need to do a better job of having a dialogue so that those developers can understand you know, the ecosystem of a hospital and how technology can fit into it without becoming a barrier. So um, this is the part where I'm gonna try and talk a little bit about the future. Um, well, in terms of virtual reality technology, there's some real breakthroughs at hand. We, we recently had um, Oculus rolled out a system that captured um, hand movement and hand controllers without having to hold anything in your hands. Um, um, we're moving into the zone of large-scale tracking where we can have room-sized uh, AR and VR or warehouse size. Uh, wireless connectivity so we can have powerful systems that aren't connected to a computer. Um, improved input methods. And again, I think the idea of mixing um, uh, the virtual environment with the real environment is becoming much more of a trend. Um, one thing to watch out for is because of these very rapid uh, development cycles, um, sometimes faster than what we're seeing in the zone of smartphones, um, with significant leaps forward with each generation, it's causing a problem for hospital IT systems because they like to um, standardize on one particular type of equipment. And it, we really don't, we don't know which is gonna be the platform of the future. I have a few um, uh, groups I'm cheering for, but um, we really don't know who's gonna be the major uh, deployer of VR and AR technology that will be used clinically. It's an opportunity for a group to focus on that. Um, of course, I think because of big data analytics, we're gonna see uh, increased use of digital twin uh, technology as part of our therapeutic process. And one of the things I think will happen in the next two years or so is, uh, Andy, you, you remember how exciting it was when uh, Walmart bought 17,000 Oculus systems. Um, I think that will happen in healthcare very soon, that there's a number of large groups, uh, uh, Synovium as a pharmaceutical company, United Health Group as a uh, insurer, Hewitt Packard, uh, Penumbra as a, uh, a public company, and MindMaze as a unicorn in the space. There are some major players spending significant amount of funds in this arena who I think will help us break through and have that landmark event where everybody will point to and say, this is really the time that VR has crossed over from just being a 
uh, something that is used uh, um, in the early adopters and it will cross over to something as part of uh, the standard of care. And I know we'll hear more from Penumbra later today and maybe they'll be the group that pushes us, us into that 70,000 system zone. Uh, I'm crossing my fingers. Um, I think the other trend that's happening is VR systems are being used for credentialing. At the Children's Hospital of LA, um, new residents cannot work in the emergency department unless they go through a virtual reality training system on how to do a pediatric resuscitation. So I think what we will be seeing is credentialing systems uh, for not just surgical procedures, but really for all aspects of healthcare that are based on simulations. And that will certainly drive the movement forward. And again, I think once we see the pharma companies start doing combination therapy of something that's based on an app or based on a VR system, uh, where we get incremental efficacy by combinations of pharmaceuticals with a digital health intervention, I think that will really drive things forward. And there are several large pharma companies that are playing in this zone currently. Um, of course, as we collect more and more data on all of this, it will drive things forward. We'll have better proof of the efficacy. And of those 200 emerging zones that uh, we're active in right now, there's really only a few that there is significant activity in. The rest are sort of um, limping along. Um, what I think we will see is there's some areas that are really underdeveloped that have huge potential, such as dealing with addictions, dealing with depression, dealing with autism, uh, dealing with disability solutions, and co better cognitive assessment. I think this will be the next wave as uh, the enabling technology, VR, AR, wearable sensors, uh, machine learning analytics, these are the zones I think we're going to see uh, surge forward because they're very underdeveloped and yet very, uh, very important. Okay, I'll, I'll summarize and hopefully there'll be a few minutes for questions. Um, digital therapeutics uh, are backed by decades of research. research uh, recent changes in the cost of cell phone and AR and VR technology makes it affordable to have a very powerful platform. All aspects of medicine are currently being used by early adopters um, in the digital therapeutics arena. Um, I feel it's poised to move into the mainstream and so do many of the larger pharmaceutical and medical device companies. And I think in the next five years, um, we will see it move from early adopters over to something as part of uh, the, cut the standard of care in certain clinical arenas. Okay, and again, I think it's the people in this room that are gonna help make that happen. I, I hope that we will have time uh, during the reception and at other points to get to know each other because we do need to collaborate, to have colleagues. If we all work at it in our own separate zone, we're not gonna get as much accomplished. So I, I, I'm very glad, I'm very appreciative, Lisa, for you putting this conference together. Okay, and, and for me personally, again, what, I, what keeps me awake at night is worrying about the healthcare crisis that's looming that's gonna bankrupt uh, the world economy if we don't move forward fast. We have maybe 15 years, maybe less. Uh, but I think um, the technologies that we've talked about right now really do make a big difference in senior care. Uh, ranging from assessments to dealing with uh, stroke and acute and chronic pain, um, all aspects of senior care are being improved by the evolution of this technology. And so it's an exciting time to be part of it. And I'm excited to be here with you today. Thank you very much. Do we have a few minutes? Yeah. Five minutes, fantastic. I think we're gonna pass the microphone. Okay. Um, um, recently there's been uh, issues with facial recognition software with respect to race. Do you see similar problems with using AR and VR in the medical field? I think it is a, um, an issue that we have to be really be prepared for. Uh, and actually, I have seen it. One of the uh, HMD manufacturers was using some of the built-in facial recognition system and found that it was not very accurate when it came to looking at, um, at Asian faces, for example. I think it's something we have to get ahead of the curve on, uh, designed for. Also, as we build these cognitive assessments um, using AR and VR technology, I think we're at risk of baking in uh, biases, uh, so we have to be really, really careful about that. Uh, I, I'd like to think that we're paying attention to it. Um, uh, I'll do my best to, 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 do, to beat the drum on that, and thank you for raising the issue, because it's something we have to be very careful about. Um, Andy? 
Um, I think I have a microphone, so I guess oh, I'll jump in. Huh? Can you talk a little bit more about the role of the avatar in the efficacy of some of these treatments, and also how important is it that the avatar is closer to a digital twin, or can it be a perhaps fantasy version of oneself? What's the importance of the avatar resembling the, the patient, and what are some of the uses? Um, it depends. It really depends. I think if you're working with children, uh, you have to be... Um, conscious of the fact that they have um, uh, often time discerning uh, um, what's real from what's not real. And we have to, as we come up with avatars, we have to make sure that they're um, comfortable for them and not scary. And, uh, but in terms of what is the role of the avatar, I think for post-discharge, for example, to be able to have a representation of your clinician, to be able to phone them up and see their avatar, answer basic questions, is gonna be so much more effective than just having a sheet of stack of paper of what you're supposed to do post-discharge. I think avatars are gonna be our companions as we um, do our quest for healthcare. And I think they're going to be an important part of uh, um, our interactions in a multi-user virtual environment. Fortunately, multi-user virtual environments are starting to evolve in a really robust way up until now. They've been sort of boring. Um, in terms of your question of how high resolution do we need the avatar to be, I, again, I think it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I, I think if they look creepy, it's not going to work. But it, so in that case, I'd say let's go more to something that's a little bit more um, abstract. But if we can make something that looks like your clinician and act, sounds like your clinician then I th and has their facial expressions, I think uh, that'll, be pretty, that'll be very powerful too. Understanding the import, the, the avatar. Uh, I think my voice is <laughs> strong enough, but that's okay. It's <laughs> yeah. I, so when we went into developing uh, the real system with Penumbra, <clears throat> what we found in in the years of uh, this being in development for four years, uh, we found that the avatar is not only critical for the sense of presence, where the patient in a VR headset looks down and sees his or her body, it became even more critical when it was required for the accuracy of the, the therapy that the size of the body is reflective. So the accuracy of where the joints are, the length so, the, because it's all about the data that the therapist can interpret it and then submit to insurance to prove progress. No, so we, we had to give absolute, uh, the, the avatar had to be the size, so we have to put the height, we have to put the, the weight to create body mass. So when you look down, if you are a heavy set person versus a, a skinny person, and it then became even more critical when you go up and down to answer the lady uh, with regards to skin tone, we have a bar that when the patient a profile is being set, it can set up the, the skin tone of the, of the person. And then it goes to the cogn cognitive critical component where it's all about making the patient believe that they no. can actually achieve those very challenging exercises post-stroke that we found that if you can make a person believe that they are a superhero, as my co-founder says, you know, he, he, he launched and produced Spider-Mans and Iron Man and X-Men and all these giant movies, he joined me because he said, if I can make a person feel as a superhero in a, in a body of a Spider-Man or, or, or a, an Iron Man, they can break through any barrier. Amir, you're absolutely right, and you bring up a really important point. But uh, we have to finish in just a... All right, <laughs> just, to, just to finish. Um, we need to have a better feeling of immersion by having our bodies be in virtual environments. If it's just our eyes and our visual system, uh, we're not really there. So we need to have a proprioceptive feedback. It needs to be realistic and feel comfortable. And it's a big part of what we call immersion, to have an avatar that represents you. So uh, I agree completely. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you.